All right, so three, two, one. Uh, Hello, everybody. Um, Welcome to our Hangout. This is uh, a format that we're going to start trying to do on a regular basis uh, where we're going to take um, just some of the common problems that we have with with Angular or some of the the feedback that we get that seems to to be reoccurring and just talk about it in kind of a roundtable fashion and um, just to be a benefit to the community. So I'm Lucas Rubelke, and um, I've been involved with, with Angular for a little bit. Um, I'm working on a book, uh, Angular JS in Action, with uh, my co-author, which is Brian. Brian, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hey, hey um, I'm, Brian. I'm Brian. Uh, uh, for those who don't know me, me uh, I, I'm the guy, I'm the guy responsible, responsible for the Angular JS battering. battering. Uh, so, uh, so I just I finished, finished my internship uh, uh, with Google. Google. Um, but, but I'm still, still, uh, still, still very much involved in the community, the community and uh, will continue to do so for uh, the immediate future. Hi everybody, my name is Mishko Hevery. I am the original author, author and the creator of AngularJS. Uh, this has been going on, it's been my hobbies now for several years, probably two plus, probably going on three years I've been working on this. This is definitely not a small project or something I've just tried. Um, and, and with wonderful help of Brian, Brian Igor, and Voita, and Voita are here, not here. Um, in the last two years we've come kind of brought them to the public from the depths of uh, Google to the uh, open source world of everybody. In the documents they talk about, um, you know, breaking your, you know, basically your services and your controllers and your different things into, into sub-modules and then injecting that into um, kind of your main application module. And yeah, so I think that's actually a good idea in retrospect. Right. So you don't think I it's think a good idea or you do? I don't think. I think a better way to uh, break the system up is by feature or rather a page or view, right? So into each module you put all the services that you need for a particular page because from a testing point of view, that's what you're going to test. Well, actually, let's talk about modules for a second. So modules are just a dependency system, and you can um, make up any dependencies you want. And in, in a way, it doesn't matter because you're up at current time. This is going to change in the future, but at current time, you can only have one, um, or you, you can only, the fix the, the number of modules that you load into the system is fixed at runtime, right? So whatever set of modules you have, that's what you have. So, in, in a way, it doesn't matter the way you slice it up. But uh, for testing purposes, you could have different set of modules for each test. So there, it does matter. Now, in the future, we would like to enable um, uh, lazy module loading, so that as you visit different pages, different modules will load. Um, so that's where we are today. So it kind of doesn't matter, except for tests. But in the future, it will matter. So in the future, the answer is definitely going to be uh, chop up your modules in a way which means that one um, one application, sorry, one or one module per page. So there's a uh, a module for the application, which is the overall, and then there's additional modules for each page. So that if there is a directive or a controller that's only applicable to a specific um, page that you're visiting, then there's no need to load that stuff until later. Yeah. And uh, to kind of second that, I think that there's a lot of um, there are a lot of different people that we talked to in the open source community that were interested in how would you use uh, kind of the dependency injection in Angular's module system to do things like A/B testing, uh, for instance. You know, they want to test two different interfaces and collect some data about which one is superior. So um, I think that same type of uh, you know module per page um, strategy would work out. Um, as well, if you wanted to, if you wanted to do that, I mean, not everyone is interested in doing A/B testing, but uh, it's cool if you kind of get that for free. Like, you know, you suddenly decide, hey, we want to re- we want to redesign this page, but we can't decide between two different things, and you know, now you could try both of them. Sure. So I think currently the answer for modules is that they only really make sense for third parties when they want to provide something to for others to reuse. You know, then obviously you have a module that you depend on. Uh, but within your app, currently, it probably means that everything goes into a single module. 
unless for testing purposes you have a good reason to split it up, which you might. Now, what about even for just, um, you know, when you've got a large amount of people working on a, on a single project? So currently, you know, we're working on a large Angular application. And so it just made it convenient, maybe not necessary, but to say, okay, our, all our services go into this module and, you know, all our controllers go into this module. And so do you see a benefit of just even having a structure just to allow a team to collaborate on an application without stepping on right. each other? So there is a the benefit for testing, right? Because if you put all the directives into a single module, then for test purposes, you just don't know the module and then the test run marginally faster. Um, it also, you can make it clean uh, in your test and make sure that you don't accidentally have dependencies going the other way, right? From the services to the directives, because you shouldn't have those dependencies. So uh, those are definitely strategies that you can go and, and follow for your particular um, developer practices, right, that you have. But it's hard for me to say, well, this is the right way, because it really matters like, what you're going to do with it, right? So it's really up to you as a developer to kind of figure that out. So would you say then is like, I mean, at the core of, of Angular, it's is write code to be testable. Is that, I mean, do you think that should drive how you organize your modules? It's ultimately is that you want to facilitate testability you know, at the end of the day. Is. Yeah, I think that's a good strategy. I think right now, uh, driving modules in the way that facilitates testing is a... Um, in the future, as I said, it might change a little bit because we're going to say that we're going to have a module per page. But right now, that's a very good strategy, a very good answer. Okay. I think that is... Uh, I mean, that, that seems like a pretty good definitive takeaway for me is, you know, based on this entire hangout, if, if I walk away, I would say, well, what was one thing I learned is that, you know, organize your modules to facilitate, you know, ease of testing. Mm -hmm. um, they basically start building, and they, they like the, the data binding, and they just, just, they just keep running with it. And what they fail to do is um, componentize the HTML. So they just keep adding to the HTML and HTML becomes right. bigger and bigger and bigger. And next thing you have is they have this monster HTML uh, with all the different switches and loops and, and everything. And that actually impacts performance because you know there's, there's more stuff and partial the stuff are hidden and so on. And so one of the things I'm gonna actually focus on with the directive talk is that you refactor your code for reusable components or when your function gets too long or when you have something that's that's conceptually a unit and you refactor it into a separate uh, function. In a similar manner, you need to do the same thing with HTML. You need to aggressively basically go after HTML and say, okay, when you have a reusable component that others could use, you know, pull it out and uh, turn it into a directive, reusable directive. Right, right. And so the, what that does is that even if you don't reuse this particular directive, it, it helps people understand conceptually how your application is built, built together because you don't have a sea of divs and from those divs you try to imply what the structure is. Instead, you have a HTML and a divs is a secondary runtime um, artifact. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think Lucas, you you wrote or said something the other day that um, directives let you introduce domain-specific language into your HTML. I think that's a big thing that like people don't really get. Like they think, okay, um, you know, directives are for widgets. Period. Right. And then they, you know, ng include until the cows come home or something. And really, a lot of the time, I think um, ng include abuse could be better factored into directives because then it also gives you better semantics as well. Sure, I agree. So the way I'm going to structure the talk on Tuesday is I'm going to start with the simple directives and get to comp uh, reusable components. And basically, I'm going to say, look, hey, look, you know, you have a reusable piece of code and you have you want to have it multiple times on the page, and so you pull it out into a directive, and the directive could have a template URL, and so you put your template in there and hope that this kind of pulls in. But the trouble is with this particular approach is that if you want to bind something that's external, like let's say you have a title that, let's say, let's say this reusable component needs to have a username, mm -hmm. right? 
So then it turns out that the username has to be declared in the outside scope, which means if you want to reuse it, like let's say it's a repeater, you got to remember that you have to put what you want to bind into into the username. So this communication channel between the outside world and a directive is very um, implicit. It's very hidden. It's not obvious. And worst is that it's a little, um, if you accidentally forget to set this particular value, you, you might get you might inherit something else, right? Mm -hmm. So what you really want is instead of having implicit scope leakage and then using these variables, you want to have an explicit parameters mm -hmm. into these reusable components. In other words, the reusable component uh, should it should not matter in what is the parent scope it lives in. Right? It should be independent. No matter what I put in the parent scope, it should in no way influence what is inside of the, uh, the component. And the only way that the two can talk to each other is through the proper explicit kind of connections. Okay, so this is where the isolate scope comes in. Right? I'm still a child of your other scope, but I'm isolated. I'm no longer prototypically inherited from you. And so, um, I don't have to worry about accidentally leaking stuff from the outside world into the reusable component. And because the component is not isolated, it will behave the same way no matter what you want. If you isolate the component, then you have no way to communicate with the component. So maybe you have to have an explicit port. And um, this explicit port is um, very nice, Brian. Google Effects app. You just discovered this? Welcome to the party. <laughs> um, I have seen it, but I haven't bothered playing with it. Yeah. Um, what was I saying? Sorry. You distracted me. Right. So you need to ports, and so once you have ports, you um, you have to explicitly kind of hook them up and uh, and say basically that. Uh, you know, this, this thing goes, goes over there, there. and this, this is where these, these, these mappings come in, where you have the equal sign, or at sign, or ampersand, or um, basically saying what, what kind of mapping you happen to have. Anyway, so once you have that kind of directive, then you say, well, sometimes directives need to be, you need to transclude stuff. And what does transcoding mean? So let's say you're a, uh, a, a pane where you, like, you act like a window that you decorate the content with some other extra stuff which you can minimize, maximize, or whatever else, like a display dialog box or something like that. Um, so in that case, the particular problem is that the directive has kind of a shell, but then you want to put different content into that directive depending on what the directive is intentionally. Right. So, so now you have to kind of move over and do what we call transclusion. Okay, okay, so now let's come to the discussion of scopes. So, so in order for uh, the transclusion to work the way you would expect it, um, you, you have to uh, say, well, if I have uh, a, a directive called, let's call it a, call it a, uh, a window, so, so it decorates a piece of div that looks like a window with minimizing and maximizing and all the other stuff, right? If I have a window directive, um, then, then what I'm transcluding, if I have a variable called username, I would expect that username to be coming from the parent, right? I would expect that username to be coming from above, like for example, maybe above the whole thing, there's a controller which declares the username. So the transcluded content can um, ask for a username, and the username might come from a controller that's above everybody. Right. So a problem. The problem is that, well, what if the directive the definition internally happens to use a username and clobbers it with something else. You don't want that clobbered information to show up inside of your um, inside of your transcoded content, right? You basically want to say, well, that's separate. It has nothing to do with what's around it, right? So you have this weird setup where you basically have to say, well, the transcoded content is just a child scope of the parent scope, right? So the stuff works as you would expect, nothing special over here. But the the, trans the, 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 the widget, widget itself, the window, the diffs, and all the data binding inside of there, that has to be isolated. Right? So, so now you have two, two different kind of scope, and the way you set it up is you make them siblings, right? right? So you have two siblings, one for the directive and one for the transclusion. And the transclusion scope is inherent from parents, but just like you expect. 
and any uh, the directive scope is isolated so that it doesn't have any leakage from the inside wall. And also, this is the reason why it's assembling not apparent of the transfusion, because we don't want to link anything to the children as well. So from within the directive, how do you reference or distinguish between transcluded scope and um, isolated scope? Why? My question is, why do you need to distinguish? Why do you care? So, like, if you're referring to a property, like, let's say, username, is that, let's say you have a username on your directive scope and a username on your transcluded scope, is uh, how do you know, or how do you say, I want to call, like, I want to reference the one in the transcluded scope versus the one in... So, you can't, right? Because the whole point of directive is to become a reusable component, right? And so, no matter what is around you, your variables are independent from everybody else. And the only way you can communicate with the outside world is through the explicit uh, parameters that you declare. That's your only connection to the outside world. Other than that, as a directive, you are uh, isolated from everybody else because that's the only way you can uh, assert that you're reusable, right? So you still have to treat, like, transcluded scope, like, you still have to set up that explicit, like, connection to it. Is that correct? No, all this stuff happens automatic when you, um, when you start declaring ports on a directive, uh, when you say scope colon and then you have a hash, and the hash right. is a set of ports that you can look up to. Sure. Um, that automatically triggers an isolated scope. Which then you, from your isolated scope, then you can reference things within your transcluded scope. So, because that's where transclusion is funny. It's because things inside a transcluded scope because the directive needs to be, um, uh, again, isolated. It should not have, the directive cannot accidentally leak data out and it cannot accidentally uh, be affected by the external data, right? It's isolated. That's the whole point. Sure. So it's isolated, but then how do you communicate with the sibling scope that has been created through transclu transclusion? Okay, so let me ask a question. is Why does the directive need to communicate with the content? So let's, again, if you are a directive that decorates something with a window UI paradigm, right? Mm -hmm. Why does the window need to know, you need to communicate with, the, with the, its content? The whole point is the window says, I am responsible for this decoration, but whatever is inside of me, that's not my business. Oh, I think I've got it. So it just kind of, it just says like we're two totally autonomous cars on the same road and you do your thing and I'm going to do my thing and got it. Ding. Okay. So that's it. It's cleared up for me. That makes sense. Okay. Now go to everybody else. So that wraps up our Hangout. Uh, I hope you have, have learned a few things about Angular. And if you have any questions or you know, something that has just you know, really confused you about the framework, um, hit us up on Twitter and shoot it out. And um, we will uh, we'll try to work it in and, and address it. So uh, thanks for joining us and have a totally awesome day.